K K Mehta, and he is going to speak on a new approach to reduce glistening and PCO. In fact, for all of us, although we have conquered most of the features in a, in a lens, the PCO still haunts us. And when this lens and the technology comes with a promise that the PCO is going to be less or nil, it really excites us. So, Dr. Keki. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to now go on to a little different part of the entire picture and try and see how we can reduce glistenings. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Ramamurthy for covering most of the points, so I can literally skim over a lot of them and then go on to the main meat of the matter, as one would call it. When we talk of glistening, what do we mean? Glistening essentially means to shine by reflection with a lustrous effect. To give an example, a setting sun glistening off the lake is what is termed as glistenings. And what was the, in the International Society for Intraocular Lens Safety originally showed the pictures or data of 67 cases where visual impairment was significant. A little bit of statistics to put it into the right perspective. Glistening's incidents, Acrisoft 42 cases and had in a good number of them. And so it occurred also with a number of other lenses References are at the bottom for your news. But the problem essentially is related to the material from, the, from what it is manufactured and the process by which it is made. Intraocular lenses can either be molded or lathe cut. If a lens is molded, the, proce the process allows gaps to form within the material. These gaps allow water to collect and the water-filled inclusion causes the light to scatter. As the light is refracted and scattered in the water polymer interface, it leads to a sparkling appearance of the fluid-filled vacuole, hence the term glistening. When we, it can occur in many different lenses, it's not only restricted to one lens, but the Acrisoft became famous for glistening and literally became, as one would say, the flag barrier or flag holder for the glistening materials. The percentage of patients with glistening usually increased up to 90 days post-operative and then became stable, excepting for Acrisoft, which had a continuous increase up to 720 days, which is almost two years. Glistening progressively decreases the quality of vision. There's growing evidence that as the glistenings increase, the patients complain of poor vision and disabling night glare. And it tends to be severe in some patients who have difficulty adapting and even functioning with it. When we look at the fall in vision due to glistenings, as you will notice, against the light, face recognition progressively drops. And uh, uh, driving is compromised. This is a, a stray light among European drivers. And uh, the data essentially showed that there is progressive difficulty in driving, indicating that dangers occur at night driving, and especially in centers like, for example, in Germany, where people have to drive by night as a regular routine, the presence of glistenings can cause more and more hassles. Driving at night with glistening, as these pictures show, causes a progressive fall in both contrast as well as clarity. And the other interesting thing, which is less talked about, is the factors which influence glistening. The mean density glistening score is higher if the Lenses are incubated with aqueous humor at body temperature, and interestingly enough, the in occurrence was more in diabetics as compared to non-diabetic patients, and the density was more. And glaucoma, statistically significant association between the incidence of severity of glistenings and glaucoma. We are not sure whether it is the glaucoma per se or it is the anti-glaucoma medicine. And interestingly enough also, patients on antidepressive agents had an increase of glistening. Classical appearance of glistening on the slit lamp. Okay. As you can see along here, see these fine little spots running down the line. The interesting factor is a lot of the patients see 6-6, but they complain and crib that they are uncomfortable. 
these are little glistening spots that you see on both sides. And uh, this progressively increases over time, as you will notice. The greetings of glistening after a singer who was the one who had done a great deal of work on it, he called them as grade one, grade two, where there's hardly any, to grade three, where there's almost 20 microns in size, to grade four, where it becomes extremely obvious. And the preliminary conclusions, that though they don't seem to be present in day one, it progressively increases and it causes glare, contrast sensitivity problems progressively increase. So it would be interesting that how should we actually handle it? We, up to the present moment, we talk of glistenings and everybody, as one would say, skirts it over as if it is not really very important. But on the other hand, most ophthalmologists would be outraged if the glistenings developed in their camera lenses. So it is surprising, as one would say, as Mainster has commented, that it is often ignored in the patient's implanted eyewear. And ignoring an issue doesn't make it go away. As a little joke says, if you are mistaken in what you see, the ship is only taking a little water, it's not sinking. And in actual fact, the Titanic sank finally. So in a final answer, we have to use a material which is so stable that this problem does not occur. But where do we get this material? And that is where the, the lens of the future, which is the Hoya, which is the world's first ozonated IOL, whose posterior surface is coated, came into place. And this particular lens has the advantage that it not only reduces the glistenings to zero, but it virtually eliminates another bugbear in IOL practice, namely posterior capsular thickening. Because if we can eliminate these two main headaches, then Almost all lenses are good, but this one is significantly better. I won't comment on the UV ozone treatment, which has already been spoken upon by Dr. Ramamurthy. But just to mention that it is a posterior surface which is treated, it is not a coating, and hence, since it is not a coating, there's no risk of release from the treated surface. So the question often asked is that over a period of time, does the coating diminish, does it wear off, does it leak or leach into the anterior chamber and that does not exist. So this is something we have to look into. The other advantage is increased adhesivability of the material which cuts down on the possibility of capsular thickening which works simultaneously for helping us as with as far as our uh, posterior PCO is concerned. And of course, a rough haptics, better grip, it doesn't stick, and prevents any growth along the sides. And the diminishment of the PCO by the edge sharpness, of their lens design and edge sharpness, which is a little different. Normally, what we, over, over in the earlier days when we were worried about PCO, we made the edges sharp. Unfortunately, they also landed up with a tremendous amount of reflection. And classically, patients would complain that they see a ring occurring at the side. This has been eliminated by the design in which the edges are blended out. So it has the advantages of the sharpness, edge sharpness, the hold back, as one would say, or the damming of the PCO growth onwards without the risks which tend to occur. And the textioning of the optic edge also reduces the dysphotopsia. So the reflections of the edge does not occur. No one complains about it. Though there's been a lot of experimental work done on the material, which shows that the posterior surface modified IOLs really seem to work extremely well. The clinical data based on human studies and which was released, which showed that a year after, the results were pretty good. And uh, the clinical cases showed that the patients over a period of three year period hardly showed any changes. My personal data, my work over the last 28 months, I've implanted this lens in about 167 cases. Most of my practice is multifocal, so I'm still waiting for Hoya to release their multifocal lenses so that my volumes can go up proportionately. And uh, in an effort to maintain a commonality in the cases, a single surgeon, namely I had done, all of them were done with the same machine, all were polished using the same method, and all were examined post-op by both surgeons. Any variance removed from the list. Our criteria of grading 
of the posterior uh, um, thickness of the posterior capsule was on grade O, grade 1, which is the standard system which is utilized for grading. And these are my pictures running nine months following surgery, virtually clear. The big white thing is the reflection of the surface. One year following surgery, hardly, and two years following surgery, which is hardly anything at all. I don't have any follow-up beyond that, but that is what it is. Our incidence of YAG laser, in the 166 cases we have done in seven cases when the vision fell to 69, which is grade two, translates into a YAG rate of 4%. In comparison, the size at the same time period was 9.8, while we were using a Rayner lens, which is 11.6. So this is literally half the regular YAG rates of the others. And uh, I'm just going to show you quickly, we were talking of implanting this lens through a 2.2. I'll just show you how this lens functionally implants even through a 1.8 millimeter incision with comparative ease. This is the incision which has been made. You can notice it is quite snug. And uh, uh, the preparing or priming of the implant is simplicity itself. It really is a foolproof system, and there's no hassles in doing it. If your technician can com comfortably fill it, you really don't have to worry. Given in your hand, you don't have to bother. And it goes in comfortably through. You have to literally work it in like you work. If with a 1.8, you have to work it like you work your foot into a sock. You have to ooze it in, and it goes in without much of a problem. You can roll it around, and your lens gets implanted comfortably. And this is your 1.8. As you notice, it goes in, but it is snug, indicating it's a 1.8 millimeter incision. So this lens goes through even a smaller incision than the 2.2 gives excellent results, gives reproducible uh, uh, safety as far as your PCO is concerned, and of course, it has no glistenings.